Hi, my name is Yang, and I work on Plasmic, which is a visual builder for the Jamstack. I'm here to talk about performance and the frontiers of shipping less JavaScript, but a little bit of background first. So Plasmic is a visual builder that you can plug into your own code base. You plug it in like a headless CMS, but it has a rich no-code page builder where you can customize it with uh, your existing components and then drag and drop them in the editor. And that way you can enable non-developers in marketing or design to create fully custom landing pages or any other rich content or experience in your app uh, while eliminating a bunch of code and dependency on developers and uh, just empower your whole team to move super fast. Uh, now the teams that use Plasmic, uh, these can range um, everywhere from performance sensitive e-commerce stores to Fortune 500 marketing sites like Intuit. So performance at scale is something we care a lot about. Uh, in this talk, I wanna share some of our own learnings uh, in the space. And um, it starts with you know, understanding the importance of performance. Performance directly impacts bottom line. Uh, there's a bunch of studies by companies where they uh, experimentally measure the causal impact of uh, latency on metrics like traffic and revenue. And now it's gotten even more important with the new impact on search rankings. Uh, Google has rolled out the page experience update to its algorithm where uh, basically, they're now factoring in these three perceived speed metrics, which are together called core web vitals. And uh, we'll dig into this in a little bit. Um, so good thing we're running on the Jamstack and generating static sites and serving these from the edge and all that. Uh, how are we doing on performance? You can use Google Lighthouse to measure and report a single performance number that rolls up all the web vitals metrics. Um, now, one common issue I see folks doing, uh, if you measure desktop performance from your MacBook, you'll probably see some pretty solid performance scores. But if you look at what Google sees, it might be pretty different. Um, you can do that from the links here. It's a more controlled environment and measuring mobile performance and whatnot. Uh, but these are the performance scores for the sites of a bunch of leading Jamstack frameworks and vendors. I don't want to performance shame anyone. Uh, our own website was very much smack dab in the middle of this. Uh, you have many peers if you're in the yellow or red. Um, it can look like a harsh grader. Uh, many sites that supposedly are about good performance get low scores, and they are, for the most part, employing all the best practices around images and preloading, et cetera. So uh, what's going on? What do these all have in common? If we come back to what those metrics are that go into the performance score, it breaks down to largest contentful paint, which is how quickly the biggest thing on the screen shows up, like your hero image, uh, first input delay, which is how quickly you can finish responding to the first user interaction, and uh, cumulative layout shift, whether things are jumping around on the screen as loading is happening. Uh, all these things contribute to the perceived loading time. And uh, like I said, the sites are, for the most part, employing best practices already around images and fixing their dimensions and uh, all that. But the main remaining hurdle is uh, really around that first input delay. The main culprit here is JavaScript that's blocking the main thread. The problem is that modern frameworks like Gatsby and Next and Nux and Angular and SvelteKit and all these modern declarative frameworks um, Sure, they're emitting static HTML, which gets things to show up quickly, but they still need JavaScript for interactivity. And the way things work is uh, you have to fetch all the code and data uh, needed to render the whole page, uh, including all the JSX, but um, also all the content and data that you already have uh, rendered on the server and downloaded as HTML. Uh, you have to fetch and reevaluate and hydrate that into your document on the client. And it's this all or nothing affair where um, even if the only bit of JavaScript that you need is to toggle your sidebar nav, uh, you end up pulling down the bundles to render the full page. If you try just removing the JavaScript bundles from these sites, um, and it's easy to try this out using overrides in Chrome DevTools, um, that'll significantly improve these scores. And I thought this was an interesting graph you can pull up from the HTTP archive. The amount of JavaScript that's shipped on the web is just a problem that is ballooning over time. So what's the solution? Well, if we want to ship less JavaScript, we could go back to static or server rendered templating languages. Uh, you know, that's certainly fine for an entire class of websites and blogs. And uh, you know, maybe the amount of interactivity on the page is just manageable enough where uh, you only need to sprinkle in a little bit of imperative DOM manipulation like in the old jQuery days. But to help development scale, if you have anything more complex, um, it would be nice to retain as much of the programming model of these modern declarative client-side component frameworks as possible, uh, but only when you need it instead of for everything on the page. 
So there's a bunch of recent work on new and old frameworks that fit this bill. They all rendered uh, HTML and let you write declarative stateful components for client-side interactivity, but you only pay the cost where needed. And I came across more than what's shown here, but we'll take a closer look at the first two of these that I thought were most interesting. So we'll start with Marco. Uh, Marco was one of the first on the scene. It's been around since at least 2014 uh, out of eBay, and it actually directly inspired a bunch of the work by other frameworks I'll be sharing, which is very cool. Um, this is a good example of how it looks um, it looks and feels like a client-side component framework. Uh, this code on the right will be shipped as a client bundle. Um, but if, like on the left, you're just rendering server-side data or HTML tags, uh, it'll be kept to just HTML without any bundling. Marco's key highlights uh, that it pioneered are uh, streaming rendering and partial hydration. And it's really partial hydration that I'm focused on for this talk, but it's still interesting to quickly mention streaming rendering since that, um, that can combine with partial hydration. So streaming rendering is how when you're uh, rendering data on the server, in most server rendering systems, you're fetching all the data you need to render the page, you render the full page, and then you send the result out to the browser. Uh, but you know, different data can take different amounts of time to load. So uh, rather than block everyone on loading all the data, uh, Marco performs this incremental streaming where, um, and what you don't see here is uh, fr from this animation is that you can actually do this out of order um, but basically, you can mark certain parts as lazy loaded, uh, a placeholder is rendered instead, and the server continues to stream the rest of the page. And then afterward, at the end of the document, this loaded section will um, be fetched in you know, right after the closing HTML tag, uh, along with a tiny snippet of JavaScript that then pops it into the correct place, overwriting the placeholder. So that really helps with uh, everything from first contentful paint metrics to um, uh, getting you the head really fast so you know what other resources to download, et cetera. Um, but the other highlight is uh, really partial hydration. Um, and if all you need to hydrate are these buttons, then that's all you'll download. And this is enabled by um, its uh, compiler, just knowing you know what components have state and what don't. People describe this as uh, having islands of your app that need hydration. And so the hope is that these islands are really small parts of the page and not the entire page, uh, which is you know just going to reduce to um, how SSR and SSG work today. Uh, so I was thinking, how well does this metaphor actually hold up? One of the examples for Marco is a Hacker News clone, complete with a collapsible comments page. I thought this was a great little example of interactivity, not necessarily being relegated to a leaf node of the tree or um, you know a specific part of the tree, but actually just scattered throughout the entire page and even wrapping the content. Um, this is something where if we were just attaching this behavior uh, with vanilla JavaScript, it would be fairly straightforward, and uh, you know you don't need to fetch or hydrate anything. Um, the left shows the code for this recursive comment component. Um, in, in Marco that takes the tree of comments as this big JSON data structure and then spits out uh, the markup, including a bit of client-side state to toggle the CSS display property. So, you know, it kind of what you would expect from these um, if you were just writing it in a, in a component framework. That JSON describing all the comments, that's pretty big. It's basically in the contents of the entire page. So we want to avoid fetching that and hydrating that if possible. And it would be pretty amazing if you write this code in this natural way and um, you know Marco could just do things optimally for you. Unfortunately, that's not the outcome in this demo app. The moment you introduce state into the component, the entire thing requires hydration, so this component actually doesn't avoid the bundle. However, the above is something the team told me they're working on. The next version of Marco will have subcomponent hydration uh, enabled by smarter compiler data flow analysis, which means that this will just work in the optimal way, which is very exciting. So next up is Astro. Astro is very much a server-side templating language, just a front matter script to fetch data plus some JSX to render. Astro itself doesn't have any way of expressing client state. What you can do, and this is the real highlight, is that you can directly include components from React, Vue, et cetera, in your template like we're showing here. The way this works, uh, by default, everything you render is pure HTML. There's nothing being hydrated on the client. So uh, even if you include like an interactive, uh, stateful, effectful React component, it's not nothing's going to happen on the client. Um, it's going to be lifeless there. Uh, but you can opt in to 
client-side interactivity. And you can furthermore specify when exactly that happens, you know, as soon as the page loads or lazily when the main thread is free or only when it comes into view. Um, it makes common use cases super easy. And, you know, Astro really aims to help users fall into the pit of success when it comes to performance. But so now you have all these independent islands of React trees. When you're hydrating a bunch of these different islands, how exactly does that work? Um, so Astro does currently serialize all the props independently of each other, uh, which is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, so it's just some small thing to be aware of if you do need, for instance, a bunch of disparate components to consult a bunch of the same data. Uh, but this is also something that I can uh, imagine changing over time. What about composition? How exactly is this hydrated? Say you're building the collapsible comments or um, you're building an FAQ page with accordion answers, basically something where you know your islands of interactivity are wrapping the content. And again, we ideally don't want to hydrate all the content. Um, we just want to sprinkle in a bit of JavaScript around it to make the toggle work. So what Astro does is um, since that content, that P tag is already in the downloaded HTML, uh, we can just read that out and uh, pass that in as the children. And we do this using um, a React component that does a uh, dangerously set inner HTML, which uh, actually, when React is doing a hydration render, uh, this is a no-op. It tells React to not descend and touch anything there. So this is really nice. And it also means that any nested React components, which again, these are all separate islands, uh, they're left intact as well. So you might try to write this um, recursive Astro components that uh, spits this out, spits out this tree of comments with every level wrapped in some React. But the team actually told me that Astro doesn't currently support re recursive components, uh, but that's more of a small note. Um, and, and you don't want to recurse on the React side since um, you know once you step into React, you'll no longer be able to dart in and out of hydration, which is um, all managed by Astro. So uh, while you can't write recursive components, uh, you can just just have the component have a component that um, internally builds up this JSX element tree however it wants, um, and that should work. There's a big caveat uh, that you have to be a little bit careful how you treat props at children and um, and don't cause it to be unmounted or remounted in any way, um, or else you're gonna mess up those nested hydrated components. Uh, so for instance, in this case, you shouldn't be conditionally rendering children. You want to ensure the component is just toggling the display property instead. Um, so there's a bit of awareness needed around how the low-level machinery works. Um, and uh, tangentially uh, related to this is uh, a small note that um, is probably worth calling out. Even though you have a React component around another React component, um, React contacts won't work since these are disconnected islands. There are different React routes and not part of the same React tree. Um, if you want them to share state, uh, you'll have to reach for some external state management like Redux or MobX. If we take a step back, effectively, we're manually splitting out the um, client portion of the code into the React component and keeping the server portion in Astro. Whereas Marco is basically aiming for its compiler to do this separation automatically for us. So Astro is a little bit more explicit I want to also quickly mention the reason why I keep coming back to this example is because this sort of composition is a very core pillar of how all these um, modern declarative component oriented frameworks let you express UIs. And so this is a look at how, um, how seamlessly the partial hydration works with uh, or against this paradigm and uh, where the limits are that you should be aware of as a developer. The action isn't all just happening with these alternative frameworks. We'll see how uh, React is evolving as well. Uh, and you actually can already hack up your own partial hydration. There's existing work here, including this old proof of concept for Next.js that I, I see people sometimes citing. Um, the way it works is you wrap certain components in this with hydration utility so that on the server, um, when you're rendering, you extract all the props as JSON so that they can be serialized later on in the document. Um, and then you replace Next.js's main script with something that looks for just the islands that you've specified um, and hydrates those. And, uh, and you're manually enumerating the components you want to hydrate in that script so that they're um, included in the bundle. And that's it. Uh, it's very simple, but it also throws away a bunch of Next.js. It's doing things manually. 
Um, it doesn't handle interleaving content and interactivity, um, et cetera. Uh, so let's keep looking. Um, React 18 is uh, coming soon, and it's huge. But among other things, it brings uh, streaming SSR, uh, similar to Marco. Uh, Marco was way ahead of its time, uh, but also really exciting to see this come to React in, it, in React's own way. Um, a feature is selective hydration, uh, which lets you mark React components with React.lazy. So uh, it'll hydrate whenever the code loads. Um, if you see to it that it never loads, you know this is a bit of an opt-out of hydration model rather than opting into hydration. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see how far we can get with just that. You can actually make this change in the React 18 server uh, demo code sandbox and just see this in action and play with it. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then uh, further out on the horizon is bundle-less React server components. A giant disclaimer here is that uh, nothing I'm saying will necessarily even be true, and uh, it's still a work in progress. Uh, but unlike SSR, where you ultimately are expected to hydrate the full tree on the client, you can tag your components as either these orange server components or blue client components, uh, or a shared component which can run anywhere. Um, and at the end of the day, you just uh, get HTML plus you know, just the bundles for the client components. And and composition works. You can have client co components that um, wrap around server components, so you can have your collapsible comments. It's actually fancier in that you can stay on the same page and keep calling back to the server to re-render or uh, update the server component parts of the page. Um, you can't call from client to server components. Uh, the tree has to be rooted on the server. So in, in other words, uh, without leaving the page, you can refresh the orange uh, server component parts uh, while the blue client components retain their state. So this is kind of fancy, but um, even for static sites that don't have that, and you're just building a multi-page app or, or and, and just initial page loads for uh, server-driven um, apps, this would make a huge impact. So we'll be in this world where you have server components, and that's actually a layer before the SSR. And then SSR, which is really like a simulated client environment, it's evaluating the client components on the server um, to get an initial HTML snapshot. And then you have the client hydration for any client components. This is going to have a big impact on performance and is why the Shopify CEO declared that uh, it was only with server components that they felt React was ready for e-commerce, which you know tends to be a very performance-sensitive space. Um, and now they're building their own hydrogen framework on top of it. So React isn't standing still. But for a solution that you can use today, you can look into one of these other great frameworks. SiteSpeed is, at the end of the day, just one objective. But um, if there's an opportunity to do so for your site, um, I would encourage you to consider ways to cut down on the JavaScript that you do ship to your users. We at Plasmic, being in the space of making a headless page builder, we're super interested in performance in general and in this space in particular. Uh, for all the pages and content that you build in Plasmic, it already employs all the best practices around images and optimization automatically. And our API now supports bundle-less static HTML generation. So you can plug this in with any of these frameworks to get maximum performance. Uh, check us out. Ping us on Twitter or DMs. We're happy to talk anytime. Thank you so much. Sit, Jamstack, sit. Woof, woof. Good boy.